hang on a second. The split second um, moments that are in between the action do these paintings become abstract, ambiguous, and open ended as to the unknown events which have preceded or may follow. Rachel Lancaster lives and work in, works in Newcastle upon Tyne. She has exhibited widely and taken part in numerous projects, performances, and artist residencies, both nationally and internationally. In 2015, she was invited to be artist in residence at Alvave Brook Road in New York, former residence and studio of Elaine de Kooning. In 2018, Lancaster was shortlisted for the Contemporary British Painting Prize. Rachel Lancaster is a selected member of the Workplace Foundation Community of Artists. Paul Smith is a musician best known as the singer for the British alternative rock group Maximo Park. He briefly worked as an art teacher and studied art history at Newcastle University after completing a foundation course at Cleveland College of Art and Design. Maximo Park released their debut album on Warp Records in 2005, and Smith continues to perform and record with the band who are currently recording their seventh album. His latest studio album, Diagrams 2018, features workplace artists Rachel Lancaster on vocals and guitar. So as usual, we'll try and make time at the end of the um, session for questions. If you could try and make use of the Q&A function down the bottom and also the chat, I'll try and field both and gather the questions and, and ask the most pertinent questions to, to Paul and Rachel. Um, so enough of me. Uh, here is here is Rachel. Welcome, Rachel. Where are you? Oh, hold on. <laughs> Hello. Okay. Uh, oh, there we go. <laughs> here is Paul, and I will. Once Paul's arrived. Hello, here Paul. We <laughs> We're all there. Uh... <laughs> As usual, I'm going to disappear now and um, work the images. Please request anything, order me around, and see you later. See you. <laughs> Thanks, Miles. <laughs> Thanks, Miles. Yeah, um, we will try not to talk too much and leave some time for questions at the end, because <laughs> we had a little chat earlier on and it ended up being about two hours, but it was, yeah. <laughs> it was mostly about uh, second waves of coronavirus. Um, so not that, not that it's interesting. It's all positive stuff, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, you know, hopefully, We'll uh, we'll move past that kind of thing and lock down beards and uh, <laughs> some, such uh, topical stuff, and we'll get onto your paintings. Um, to begin with, I wanted to touch on the subject matter of um, of your paintings. I'm gonna hopefully, yeah, we're seeing Miles is putting some on on the screen for us to give us some context. Um, we'll talk about the te your technique a little bit later on. Um, yeah, your source material is as we've heard from Miles, seemingly insignificant passing shots, either from films or your own photographic archive, and you've recently started painting from dreams, which we'll come to later. I was wondering what interests you about these overlooked moments? Oh, good question, Paul. Um, I'm kind of more interested um, in things that people might overlook or might not notice. That's the main thing that I think I'm drawn to. Um, and kind of slowing people down like the way that because like today everything's pretty fast moving and things are pretty quick so it's kind of a way to get people to slow down and look at things that maybe they would like blow past them so literally taking the still out of a stream of moving images um is like a way to sort of draw people's attention to like this hidden layer in like everyday experience that they might might not notice um and that subject matter, what like the actual things that I paint, it's pretty varied. Although there's certain things that crop up, like that are repeated. Because um, we were talking about that earlier, there's like certain subjects that, even though like I've been using this process since like 1998 when I started my degree. Um, so, but there, there's like certain subjects like um, like fabrics or like hair and like textures and stuff, quite old school subject matters that you would find in like old um, like Memento Mori paintings and things like that. Um, but yeah, there's certain things that crop up and then there's other things that I kind of work in series with. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's more about uh, taking an image and then putting it in a new context really. So it's, it's not really like the thing itself isn't quite as important as like your reaction to it, I think is the main thing. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that answers your question. <laughs> yeah, it does, it does. Um, I was wondering how important the subject is compared to the end product. And yeah. you're creating a new entity with the painting. Um, would you be happy if a viewer was 
stimulated by the surface of the painting alone or would you feel like they were missing an extra layer that would enhance their appreciation uh i don't like i think um because a lot of people there's only really me that knows where exactly the images are from so then it does become about the paint and what's happening in the paint and then like the illusion that there's detail there when there isn't really any detail there as well so um so probably i think the paint comes first actually um, I have shown photographs without the paintings before as well, um, but I've, I always like circle back to painting again. So it's to do with like the surface of the paint, and then yeah, that thing where um, you think there's going to be loads of detail, and you get up close, and there's just like nothing there. I've always been really into that as like an effect. Um, so yeah, that's that's quite important to me. I think. Yeah, I mean, because a lot of people get hung up on what is in a subject, uh, what what the subject of a painting is, what is in the painting, rather than the whole thing and then other people are, are kind of the other way around and often when I'm in a gallery I'll be looking at the um the blurb that goes with it and thinking well yeah that's obviously giving me the the knowledge that I need to fully appreciate whatever artwork yeah do you, do you yeah do you do you shy away from that kind of um extra context that you can often find in a gallery uh it can add something I think your reaction to something is Primarily, you just have a gut reaction to something, and then if you like it, you'll read the text on the wall. If you don't like it, you probably won't read the text on the wall. So, um, there's got to be something in the piece of work itself, I think, that makes you want to find out more. Um, but yeah, I'd be quite happy if people didn't really know where the images are from and they just reacted to them as paintings. Because, mm -hmm. uh, like I said, there's only me that knows uh, where this, like, where the image is from. Like, and especially now, the subject matter is quite. Um, like uh, the source material that I'm getting the images from is quite wide. Like it could be some like absolutely terrible film on YouTube from like the AES, <laughs> or it could be something off TV, or it could be something that I've seen in the street that I've photographed. So um, the subject map is a bit wider now and the source material is wider than it used to be. Um, so yeah, so that's interesting to play on because a lot of the paintings um, that are from photographs that I've taken still have like that cinematic feel to them, even though they're not actually from a film. Um, we were talking earlier on as well about um, when we, we, we met each other, I think it was it Stockton Sixth Form for some sort of life drawing class. And you'd yeah, it was your night class, yeah. <laughs> doing some extra, extra work, um, being the, uh, the, the interested people in, in the actual art course at our Sixth Form colleges. And then we went on to meet each other properly in Hartlepool in 97, 98. Um, for our foundation course and I was thinking you know I think about that time a lot in terms of what I'm interested in now and some of the things that in my music I write lyrics about some of the things that I'm interested in when I'm, when it comes to artwork for the the music or how to present our band which is always difficult because you know it is a group of people it's a kind of collaborative thing but yeah in terms of my own personal influences um, yeah it's some of those things are foundational that foundation course even if it was just to tell me what i didn't like and what i really didn't want to do or be um spend my time doing and i wondered whether um you feel like the work that you've made in in that foundational uh, few years not just art college because it was a broad-based kind of thing but when we when we went to university i was at newcastle university studying art history and drawing on my combined honors course and I would spend a lot of time in your studio in Northumbria University <clears throat> probably talking more and distracting you more than anything else. <laughs> um, but yeah I, I feel like there's a connection between what you do now even just in the kind of the way that you use paint or that your mm -hmm. kind of in inherent style because I, I think I mean I you know I'm, I'm not a visual artist but when I do drawings and stuff when I take my sketchbook away with me it's still kind of rooted in some of the things that I learned and the techniques that I enjoyed and wanted to develop when I was at um, at art college and university and I, I sort of think sometimes I think ah, I should I should have I should be beyond this obviously I, <laughs> I think that too actually this uh, I can't remember which artist it is but they say that like uh, if the same subject matter keeps knocking on the door answer it <laughs> I think that's what keeps happening with me. Um, in terms of like most, like specifically on the foundation course though, was when I learned how to uh, use like a, 
SLR camera and how to develop my own photographs. So like that, that breaking down of process and like learning a new skill and stuff. And that, that definitely has like fed through all of my work, like photography or not using photography, but it's still reflecting photography, even if you're not using it. Um, so that definitely like directly comes from doing stuff at foundation course. Um, and then I think, yeah, quite a lot of stuff, really. I think um, it's obviously more of doing it for this like 20 odd years ago, we did the foundation course scarily. <laughs> um, it's obviously more developed now, but I think at the heart of it, it is still kind of the same, but just a more, uh, maybe more developed version. Um, but yeah, it's still, it's kind of, there's quite a lot of uh, themes that like crop up. I think that you're right, actually, the way that I use paint is still, um, so there's a, a, yeah, definitely a thread running through it. Uh, and I've always used drawing. I did quite a lot of drawing on the foundation course and drawing's always been like a really important part of my process that I think, a lot of people see the finished paintings, but they might not realise that I actually do like tons of drawings like behind the scenes. Um, so that's quite an important part of my process too. And was there a, a stage that in hindsight you feel was a breakthrough for your work? Um, or do you feel like it's more of a long continuum and there's just a, a gradual evolution? Or do you feel like, oh, this was the point where I was, I, I really started developing something that felt my own and that I was going to continue with and explore over the coming years? Uh, yeah, there has been. There's like many little mini breakthroughs along the way. And then probably the biggest one for me was when I went to Newcastle Uni to do my MA in uh, 2009. Um, and for the first year of that, I was painting because I've always just been like a painter's painter and um, just paint like that was the only thing that I was interested in, <laughs> painting and drawing. And then when I got to the MA, I realised like I was kind of stuck in a bit of a rut. Um, so yeah, when I got to the MA, um, I painted for a year, then realised I was really bored of like the ideas that I was having. Um, so basically for the last year I didn't paint and that from about 2010 till about 2015, I didn't do any paintings. Um, I made like uh, video and film stuff. Um, so that was quite a breakthrough, a kind of, it wasn't deliberate, I didn't intend to spend that long not painting, but it just ended up being that long that I tried other things and, um, of being in like bands and stuff too so there's quite a lot of music was happening and it's uh it's easier to take photographs and stuff when you're uh, on tour than it is to take like <laughs> some canvases and do some oil paintings um so it was just like a bit of a natural break but i think it's ended up being quite a beneficial thing in the end for having that break i feel like the work that i'm making now is richer for having um for like sort of breaking apart the process and like challenging myself a bit really because i'd got to the point where um I was painting and I could kind of, I knew how to make like a painting look good almost but without really having to put too much effort in in a weird way. Um, not to sound arrogant but there's just like a way that you can paint and it's like it wasn't really challenging anymore so I think I sort of uh, throughout my uh, practice I always try and throw in like curveballs to try and throw myself off to like try something new sort of subconsciously or very deliberately. <laughs> um, so yeah with the MA like I'd literally never made um, like I edited a video before I made a video. And then for my MA show, I actually show, only showed photographs and videos. So for me, that was quite a big, big move. Um, quite, a, yeah, big, big change for me. Do you, do you feel like that was anything to do with the weight of history that comes with painting? You know, there's, I mean, you know, there's lots of preconceptions um, about painting. There's a lot of discussion as to whether painting is even relevant. You know, yeah. The death, we hear, often hear of the death of painting and that kind of thing. Um, do, you, do you feel like it's a bit of a burden, um, all this kind of history of painting and maybe it's, uh, you know, a bit defunct or do, you, or do you draw off it and thrive off it and are inspired by it? I mean, I, I take it you're definitely inspired by, by painting, otherwise you wouldn't be. <laughs> <laughs> there was a phase though where, where like, like you say, the... Um the sort of history of it and kind of, because I've trained as a painter, there was all of the expectations and then it, I suppose it comes down to the idea of skill and like showing that you're skilled. Um, whereas when I'm making, a, when I started making videos, I didn't like have a clue how to use the editing suite or how to use a camera really. So it threw me off a bit. And so there was a bit less pressure. I was a bit less precious about it because there wasn't as much um, expectation so was like, as long as I had something at the end of it, I'd learned something, then that was the main thing. So that really helped me to focus on 
the the idea of process and sort of taking things apart and then almost like what comes at the end of that is like a bonus but it's not necessarily like the end point um yeah so there's yeah they're, they're definitely the, the history of painting is in there but i think i've sort of got over it a bit now <laughs> um I, I kind of i think it's because i'm not i feel like i'm painting by choice rather than because it's the only thing that i felt like i could do um whereas now because i, I know how to make like audio and video pieces it's like the painting's a choice, so it's like that's the appropriate medium for the idea that I've got rather than just only being able to paint. It's yeah, really interesting. Um, are there any contemporary painters that um, particularly inspire you? I, when, I, when I'm looking in, I don't know, in interviews with bands, I'm always seeing what bands they're into. And um, yeah. <laughs> kind, of, kind of the same with painters, you know, you, you're looking for little reference points um, that you maybe wouldn't have, wouldn't have guessed. Are there any are there any particular contemporary painters that get you going? Uh, there's a lot of like older painters. <laughs> there's there's a few new ones. Uh, um, like I really love uh, uh, Catherine Murphy's paintings. Like she's she's contemporary, but she's like I think she's actually about seventy old now. But um, her paintings are, are really really amazing. The um, really tight like cropped images that look super photo real, um, but they look like they're from photographs, but she actually sets up, she has like sets that she sets up in a studio and paints from life, but they look like they're from photographs. They're really interesting. If you haven't looked at her paintings, they're really good. <laughs> and she plays with like the idea of the picture plane and like flatness and stuff. So there'll be something like as if it's glued up against the picture plane. Um, and then the idea of like illusory, like space and stuff. So hers are really good. Um, and then just like the classics, like, uh, Gusten and Raoul de Kaiser and <laughs> those kind of those guys. Yeah. Well, we've we've seen a lot of your uh, charcoal drawings floating past on the screen, so um, <laughs> we might as well discuss that. Um, over the past few years, you've done a lot of charcoal drawings, and they're usually to prepare for a painting. But I, I actually like them just as much as your paintings, and I wondered whether you saw um, a hierarchy between drawing and painting because drawing is is often seen as the prep and as a secondary thing which you know I kind of dispute um it's a bit like watercolors being seen as a hobbyist's medium rather yeah. than oils are the serious painters yeah they're really <laughs> tricky you use watercolors <laughs> they're not easy <laughs> I, about it. I, I had to teach them at some at one point and I had to learn how to use them in order to teach them yeah but, it's <laughs> Uh, I don't think I, I don't think I mastered it. Let's put it that way. Um, yeah, do you, um, what do you, how do you feel about your drawings? Do you feel like they're just prep or or what? Um, I think I used to. I used to sort of skip over them just to get to the point of like, oh yeah, like sort of. Because the reason why I started doing them was to start figuring out how to take the image apart and then put it back together again, and then figuring out what the important parts are, and then which mm -hmm. which bits you need to focus on, and then. Like say on that image that the image that was just up of the mirror, the um, drawing. Like if you saw the photograph and the drawing next to each other, that's like the kind of nowhere near. So it's kind of like figuring out the shorthand for people to think that there's more information there than there is. Um, so yeah, it was like to try and play around with like mark making um, and the scale, like how much to zoom in, how to crop things. So they started off as um, just a way. To sort of figure those things out for the painting like you say but as i've gone on i actually there used to be a hierarchy whereas now i kind of i see them as being equal really um and sometimes i'll make a drawing and it won't end up being a painting because i really like the drawing um, i haven't really shown the drawings as much um in a gallery context but they're definitely becoming more of like yeah a piece of work in their own right rather than just a, like secondary to a painting or anything um but yeah it's usually a way to try and figure out the it's like problem solving, like how we, and then sometimes um, with the drawing, because it's more direct, you've just got this piece of paper and this like dusty stuff like charcoal, um, it's like quite simple, like simplified, like broken down process. Whereas with oil paint, you've got to get all the stuff out and it's like a lot more messy. So there's a bit more, yeah, like weight behind it and a bit more expectation. Whereas with the drawing, it's like, oh, look, it's terrible. It doesn't matter. I'll just chuck it out. <laughs> it doesn't take up as much space and you can just put it in a folder. Um, so yeah, like that, that uh, image that's up now, that one I made into a painting. Um, and that one was like the idea that the, the white of the paper is the white of the, the white of the paper in the drawing is the white of the paper coming through. So when I made the painting, um, 
I didn't use any white paint, so the, the white of the canvas is the white on the picture, if that makes sense. So the idea of like getting that glow, yeah, yeah, getting like the glow coming through, um, which you can get with charcoal as well, because you get some really lovely, I've always loved, there's always quite a lot of black in my paintings, which I always got told not to do at university. <laughs> there's always tons of like velvety blacks, has always been something that I've really enjoyed. And you can get some really good dense blacks with charcoal. <laughs> um, that one's time to do painting as well, actually. But it's yeah. not quite finished yet but yeah just the idea of how to crop things and how much information to put in um like i might have missed some bits out of that in the background just to like hone in on like the the parcel itself and stuff do you do you feel like there's a similarity between the durational layering effect in when you're doing a charcoal drawing and adding more and taking things away i mean we used to you know use a rub a lot out to kind of you know get the contrasts right and which you know you, you're obviously beyond that now um but um with the paintings i believe that you've you've layered them over a a, a long course of time and are the paint are the, are the drawings much quicker or are they just you know is, is it a layering process with both of them to you or do you just you know have a have a quick approach to the drawing and then that sort of frees you up in order to have a clarity when you're when you're doing the layering of of lots of different layers of paint because the the drawings themselves end up because of the nature of charcoal they have a lot of dark contract contrasts um, yeah, yeah. whereas the paintings have this kind of transparency to them especially when you see them up close you know this the yeah iridescent in some way and yet yeah. the, the, are they both made up of lots of layers and time to you or is or is the drawing just really quick in comparison? I, th I think uh, it used to be that drawing was a lot quicker um, but now with this the painting like the way that I draw and the way that I paint's more closely related it, like you said that these are built up with lots of layers so gradually like using willow charcoal to get the dusty light lighter tones and then like really dark like black charcoal to get the sort of depth of the blacks and that's like the newer paintings that I've been making like the last maybe 18 months um, have been I work on like a few paintings at once um, and they're built up using like super thin uh, layers of oil paint and like um, alkyd medium so you get that they're sort of really loose but only when you get up close they look quite photographic from a distance but then you get up and you're like oh there's like nothing there <laughs> um, so and there's a similar play with that in the drawings um, so I think that the drawings take, do take less time actually but the, the, the way that I make them is quite similar because um, obviously with the drawing you just got tone whereas with the oil painting you've got tone and colour so it's like uh, more complicated but yeah the, the newer ones have all got um, uh, like I started the idea of not using white paint because they were getting a bit too contrasty I kind of like that in the charcoal drawings but the paintings were getting a bit too contrasty and then sometimes if you put too much white paint on it can like really kill an image and it suddenly looks really flat and dead so i had this like little challenge with myself i'll try and paint one without putting any white paint on and um, like th this one that's just up there um which is actually quite hard because it ends up you just end up wiping loads of the paint away and it so obviously takes a lot longer to make them so they're really really layered um but then like i said when you get close up to one of these they're really broken down and there's nothing really there and there's quite a lot of bright colours as well that you might not expect uh, when you get close up to the surface um so yeah the idea of slowing down the process or throwing even though i'm really familiar with the process of painting throwing like the extra element in just to like keep me learning something different or like making me have to like i always like the idea of an active painting surface instead of it just being something where you paint it, it like put it through the ritual Lancaster filter that's that one done it's more like the process of how the image comes together when you're looking at it is kind of a bit more like the surface is a bit more active rather than just like a passive copying I wanted to talk a bit more about the process as well um, of when you're when you're actually painting um because you've spoken about your paintings being of details in a broader narrative and how your technique leads to a, I'm going to quote you back at yourself <laughs> To a dichotomy of definition and abstraction and I've noticed a recurring motif which you alluded to earlier on of strands and tendrils and fibres and the parcel drawings that we saw earlier on also have lots of layers and string binding them. Um, do you get lost in those details sometimes or are you 
quite clear minded and pre planned with the met with your methods? Uh, I do. There's always like in each image that I paint because I take quite a lot of stills. I could take hundreds of stills, and then it's a relatively small percentage of them like make the grid at the end that I paint, and it's usually the ones that have a particular quality or like something really particular about them that I'd be. I'm curious, like, oh, how would I paint that? Like the strings on the parcel. I was like, oh, how would I paint that without using the white paint? So it usually starts from like problem solving kind of angle. Um, and then I've just always been drawn to painting hair um, and like, the, yeah, things that, things that when I look at it, I think, God, how am I going to paint that? And then I like start painting it and then somehow the painting's finished and I kind of didn't, I didn't really know what happened in the middle sometimes. Um, so it's like the idea of, uh, kind of the, the the image that you copy and being like a puzzle and sort of uh, mapping it out. So with a lot of the paintings, um, uh, like the newer ones, like this one that's up now, that's a newer one. And I usually map out all of the shapes um, with like a really light tone of like pins gray or like a really light tone. And then just gradually it just, as if you turn in the contrast up on it, just like gradually gets darker and darker. Um, but there usually is a particular quality. Like this one, I really liked the shine on the ribbon and then the, the idea of like the detail in the middle but you can't really see what it is because I don't know what it is like the photograph I had wasn't very good quality so I'm just kind of approximating what I think might be there so it's um yeah it's usually like there'd be one particular thing that I'm really wanting to get across and then the other bits kind of fade away or aren't as important. Is that, is that kind of leading into the um uncanny side of of what you do because you've you've mentioned how important it is to reveal the uncanny aspects and the sort of psychological charge of your source imagery um and some of some of your recent paintings are from dreams um is it easier to find the uncanny in a dream because they're often fundamentally odd or is it harder to grasp such an intangible element you know when you're trying to remember what a dream is and make sense of it you can't really do that so it, is it is it easier to find the, the sense of uncanny in a dream or is it just harder to get it? But yeah, it's a good question, actually. Um, I think it's I've always been interested in like the the weirdness, like the weird and the everyday in that kind of that sort of that level. There's like a frequency of weird in the everyday, like kind of like what David Lynch is interested in looking at, like sort of suburban things. But then there's this odd, like it's a bit off kilter somehow. Mm -hmm. um, and I think you get that you get that in films and in dreams so to me they maybe more closely they're not as separate to me because I have quite vivid dreams anyway sort of um so the one like this one's from a dream that's up now um to have a little book it's relatively recent actually and I haven't really shown them that much outside of like showing them in the studio but I have a little book where I write down if I have a particularly vivid dream or like a memory or a daydream or something and I try and write down as much detail as I can to try and describe it. And then again, out of that, there's, I've got like books full of these like notes, but then only certain ones are vivid enough that like come back to me. Like sometimes when I read the description back, I can really picture it in like my mind's eye. So it's an idea of painting something, uh, like trying to find the image in your mind's eye rather than copying it across, like from a photograph to the painting. Um, it's like the image isn't anywhere apart from in your head, which is quite tricky. But I think the, the dream ones still have that uh, film still sort of quality to them because the off painting from stills for so long, it's just become part of like a, a muscle memory, um, like how to create certain textures or shine. So like this one's from a dream. That's actually the first one that I did from a dream. Um, I did a lot that like didn't make the grade either. They just got painted over. <laughs> but some of them worked. So it was a bit less, uh, definitely got a less precious about the idea of like the paint and having to be good it's like what did you learn while you were doing it it's become more important and if if I don't like the paint and I just won't show anyone but I still might have learned something in the process I'm heck of it um but yeah for this one that was like the idea of someone's shoulder like an epaulette on a shoulder like a, a fancy old like, costume yeah. or something that you'd see in a museum um and then I could just really see it and I was trying, trying to get it across. I don't know if it comes across, but they're more sort of open-ended as well. So there's, like, I can describe what I was trying, what my intention was, but it's totally fine if you see something completely different at the same time. Yeah, it's much, I mean, this, this particular image is much more um, abstracted than 
yeah yeah most of the other ones you can you know you can have a go at finding out or, or at least for you figuring out what it is or it, you know especially when you are aware that, that a lot of them are from in between moments and that kind of explains the sort of absence within them whereas this is much more mysterious because yeah it, it's um a little bit more abstracted than than do you do you feel that this is something that you'll pursue a little bit more kind of let something that's even less representational yeah i think so i've i've still got um still got the ongoing thing of like jotting down my dreams and stuff so they're, they're all they're kind of going on on the sidelines um yeah i think as well doing the dream one like making the ones that aren't from a photograph it's really hard when you brain's trained to just look at a photograph as you're painting so it's mm -hmm. really good at breaking habits as well which i think as a painter you do get set in like a certain way of working and i really enjoy like putting the cat amongst the pigeons it, to me it was totally wild not drawing from a photograph I was like what am i doing what am I, it's going to be terrible but then um like this one um so these ones are more i mean at the risk of sounding quite cheesy they're more to do with getting a, like conveying um the capture of a feeling rather than an, an image so it's like this was like i had a dream about being <laughs> I mean, you're getting all the details here. <laughs> I dream about being in a wardrobe full of black feathers, like them being like in your face. And I was just thinking, I would have paint that. How on earth would I paint that? I mean, whether the paint's successful or not. <laughs> um, but it, it definitely was like a really good exercise in uh, just the idea of getting across the feeling of a subject matter rather than just what it looks like. Um, yeah, and that idea of capture, like what is it to capture something? Is not just like what it looks like. It's it's more than that. It's, um, and I think even though I'm painting from stills, uh, like from found imagery still, um, that feeling is in the ones that are from photographs too. So that I think they've become, I feel like my paintings have become more personal as, especially in the last three or four years, I would say it's definitely helped me to like loosen up and not worry so much. The idea of something being finished or that kind of thing, it's more to do with it, it, like process is definitely important. Um, you mentioned David Lynch and cinema being a, a big part of um, what's influenced you visually, uh, and obviously we're talking about the uncanny as well in your in your paintings. So maybe now is a good time to put up um, a picture of a cassette tape. Well, oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I shouldn't, shouldn't preempt what people think about it because. Um, a lot of people these days wouldn't know exactly what it is. <laughs> yeah, it's a bit, bit old school these days. <laughs> um, but yeah, the the this um, the painting that we're about to see, yeah, it'll lead us on to because we we used to be in a band together, and you know maybe one day we we will be again <laughs> <laughs> um, when, when we're allowed to see each other again. Um, but yeah, the, there's um, this big painting that you did of of um, a cassette, an old cassette tape. And to me, it was kind of unnerving a little bit. There's something sinister about about it because of the scale of it and the kind of teeth of the of the reel on the on the cassette, um, and the movement that's in it as well as a kind of blur. Um, and you know, we we grew up um, playing in in music, playing together, and music was just a big. And still is a bit like it's obviously a massive part of my life. It's my, <laughs> it's my <laughs> bread and butter. Um, but yeah, um, we obviously have. We started off in in practice rooms in Durham Street in Hartlepool, um, taping our music, and um, we just used, used to make lots of feedback. And every now and then a melody would come in there, and we were just interested in making noise together we just met each other and were interested in similar music and very shy and just wanted to get on with it um you know this this once you work out what it is if you know what it is then um it's it, I, you know uh, it has a, a sort of dual meaning of, of, it, of it once it's out there on the wall it's kind of transformed into this monumental thing but do you you know do you feel like there's something um deep rooted in 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 what your practice is in terms of music do you feel like it kind of it's a big part of of what you do or is this just a a coincident coincidental aspect to this to this particular painting well i've always yeah we've, be, we've always been in bands and stuff for years and it's been a big part of 
the stuff that I make <laughs> for a long time. But um, this was actually one that I made. It's uh, you might not be able to get the scale actually on the um, from the image, but it's about five feet by four feet. So it's like the spool off a, um, a cassette tape. So it's obviously like massively magnified. So I was interested in how to bring together uh, like sound into paintings um, and like how you can reference other like other senses but using painting. And um, it does have a bit of a uh, monolithic <laughs> sort of feel to it. Like it is sort of creepy, even though it's a cassette tape. It's like, how is that? Like, why is it looking so creepy? <laughs> um, but yeah, I think it always has been. And I think because I'm not, I'm trained as a painter um, and I make paintings, but I'm not trained as a musician, but I still feel that I could make music. So there's, a, it's again, it's like the idea of letting yourself just experiment and be a bit free. And I think with music, I always, I never really felt the pressure as much as with visual art in some ways. And I'm trying to bridge the two things together a bit more now, like through making music. And then um, I've also made like visuals to go with the music. And I've also made my own music. There's a bit more of a melting pot of different things happening. Um, but that idea that, as well as to do with um, how you experience music, because music's more, it happens in a space and a time, so if you're at a gig or whatever, and you're experienced it, it, like you experience something as a group too, whereas painting or looking at art's usually quite solitary. So I was interested in how to bring, I'm interested in how to bring all of those things together in a way. And um, with a lot of the moving image work that you've done, there's sound and um, an image coming together. Um, you've talked about moving paintings in the past. Can you Can you talk about that? for us here now and maybe we can put on one of the uh the little clips of of one of your films oh yeah that would be good actually rather than me badly describing it <laughs> we'll get the clip up um, um yeah i mean again that started um that started on my when i was studying on my ma um it's actually it should have some sound on it but <laughs> yeah that might be might be difficult with the zoom. Might be tricky. It's pretty abstract, <laughs> um, but yeah. So this one was uh, one that I made in collaboration with uh, Stephen Bishop, who's also a musician. Um, and he, it's a shame you can't hear the song, but it's on um, it's on uh, my um, Vimeo if you want to have a look later on. Um, but yeah, so this was just uh, it was a commission for the Tyneside Cinema. This one actually. Mm -hmm. um, so it's I Iron Violins. Uh, really close up. So it was the idea of something being moved by like a, an unseen force. Um, and it kind of looks like it's dancing around. Uh, so the sound, uh, if you could hear it, <laughs> is like the resonant frequency of iron, obviously iron violence. So it's just like an abstracted uh, like soundtrack connecting it to the, like the material that you're actually filming. Um, but a lot of the Again, I think the moving image work that I make is a lot more abstract than the paintings that I make. Again, maybe it's just because I feel a bit less pressure. There's a bit more um, freedom. Um, and I usually have like a particular, because it started with my MA where I was really interested in uh, the idea of handmade illusions. Because um, paintings, obviously a handmade illusion if you paint like trompe l'oeil paintings and mine do look kind of real sometimes. So I was interested in that idea of uh, making a handmade illusion and making something from really minimal materials but look kind of epic and a bit like monumental. Um, so this one actually is uh, using, it's from a commission that I did with um, an artist called uh, Wolfgang Voigt who runs Compact Records in uh, Cologne. Um, so he commissioned me to make visuals for him to go with his piece called Ruckver Sauberung. I'm probably murdering that because I don't speak German. But <laughs> no, that, that, that's not a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, it actually means reverse enchantment, which I think is quite a cool title. Um, and yeah, this, so the sound is a uh, pretty, um, it's pretty ethereal and kind of uh, atmospheric and quite dark. So I wanted to make some imagery that sort of fit with that. And this is actually appropriate in an um, old school special effects technique that the, um, it's called the cloud tank. So they use it on uh, Close Encounters and Poltergeist and those kind of films where um, they show like underwater and like smoke and things like that. 
Um, they usually have big massive tanks and loads of technicians and stuff in Hollywood, but I, <laughs> I had a fish tank in my studio um, <laughs> in a macro lens. So these are actually filming sort of something that's maybe two centimetres square in a fish tank in my studio. Um, and it's based on the principle that salt water and fresh water don't mix. So you inject uh, milk and fluids and stuff into the two layers and they make all these crazy effects. So it's kind of Hollywood, but done on an extremely tight budget. <laughs> um, but it did make quite an atmospheric film. And um, it was, again, this really pushes that minimal micro macro kind of thing because um, it was shown, this is like filming a two centimetre square area of a fish tank. And then it was projected, uh, I think it was about 20 feet wide, the screen that it was shown on. So obviously it really becomes like a moving painting. Um, and that idea that it's all like colours and rhythms and light and things, which are all things that are to do with painting anyway. So I really enjoyed uh, making that one. It was really nice being in the room with it on and everyone watching it together too. It was pretty cool. Yeah, I've, 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 the idea of homemade effects or kind of um, things that you wouldn't expect to be creating the effect reminds me of the Foley sound that you yeah, yeah. <laughs> have been involved with that idea of making the sounds for movies you can you'll probably be able to explain it better than i but, uh, <laughs> but so, so, well so fully uh it's funny because some people really know what it is and then some people are like oh, i didn't even know that happened in films um so yeah for these um is what they use in films to add almost every film's got foley in it and it's basically used um to add uh, extra detail and make something feel more real and solid. So that say if there was, for, for example, a crude example is a horse's hooves, you'd use like coconut shells or it's mostly in like horror films. I was really interested in the, the sort of gory, like splattery stuff <laughs> where they'd use um, like watermelons and things like that to make squidgy, you know, in uh, Alien, like the chest burst uh, sort of scene and stuff. They'd use um, like someone would be squidging around in a melon with um, like really close up mics to get the sort of really gory textures. But I really like the sort of the silliness of it and the idea that you'd use a totally wrong material to try and make the other thing seem more real. I thought that was really interesting. So I, I did some of that. I did quite a, a residency actually where I, um, where I really looked into Foley and I got really into it. Um, and I made a piece of work where I filmed the surface of my bath with some torches and stuff really close up to look like the ocean. And then I made a soundtrack which was uh, dried peas on top of a snare drum and like did loads and loads of layers of like rolling these peas around to get like an oceany sound. Um, so that was pretty cool. I like the sort of uh, the playfulness of that and it's a bit silly and sometimes I'd catch myself in the middle of making something just thinking what on earth am I doing? What have I got here? <laughs> but it's uh, yeah it makes them all fun. like remembering that you can have fun when you're making something I think that's uh, really important to remember. Yeah, did I see you at the Tyneside Cinema again again in the, gal in the gallery maybe? Yeah yeah we did a, a live Foley performance yeah. <laughs> uh, who, was, who was that with? Uh, Katie Goodwin, my friend Katie Goodwin. Because you've, yeah. you've done a lot of collaborations, which is something else that I wanted to touch on. Um, obviously, the, the collabor collaboration with Wolfgang Voigt and um, with Stephen Bishop, we've heard those mentioned. And I'm, I saw some of your um, work with your sister, Laura Lancaster, in Baltic 39. Oh, for um, a glimpse, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, and I was just wondering what you what you get out of the collaborations? To, is it something something you enjoy, and how does how does it make you feel to collaborate? Obviously, because obviously you're usually on your own in a studio, in a studio painting. Um, and you know, I I don't want to I don't want to put words in your mouth, but um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> no, it is quite lonely. I think when you choose to be a painter, you, you, um, you sort of know that you're in the studio a lot on your own, and you sort of, you you're with your own thoughts, and it's. It's almost like, well, you probably get the same with music where you get sick of like your own thoughts sometimes. And it's nice to have other ideas. Um, and thankfully, I've been lucky enough to find people who had a really similar taste, but coming at things from slightly different directions. Um, so yeah, these ones are just stills from the Wolfgang Voigt thing, just while we're, while we're chatting. Um, so yeah, I really enjoyed collaborating. And to be honest, I never thought it would be something that I would do, because I always really thought of myself as a painter and the painting on my own but um yeah the, the collaborations are really nice it gives you like a different perspective on your own stuff as well and like people like just 
having a, a dialogue with other people makes you realise things about your own work that maybe you might not know because it's your thing. It seems really obvious why you're doing what you're doing. But then if you get another person in to question you, it makes you reinforce the things that you are doing. But oh yeah, these are um, images from uh, from Glimpser from uh, figure four uh, in Baltic 39. I think that was 20, 2017. Yeah, 2017 when we did that. So we basically made these two massive screens we took over the gallery for four or five days um, and we set up two massive screens at either end of the room and then <laughs> well timed <laughs> um, and then we had speakers and projectors and me and my sister Laura Lancaster who's also primarily known for painting so it was really interesting us both being in there like sort of uh, riffing off each other doing stuff and we took in a batch of images and source materials and stuff I had my own like like an archive of photographs and then Laura had some edited cine film loops and we basically played around with um how we could fill the space up in different ways but like sort of mashing both of our practices together even but none of it was painting so that was really interesting and um i did a performance as well where uh i used the sounds of laura editing her cine films and like the spools and the reels and stuff and i edited the sounds and made like a sort of uh, a piece of uh, sound work that sort of filled the galleries we were playing with the projectors and stuff um, so that was that was really fun. Did it feel did it, did it feel like an isolated thing, a bit of a break, and then get back to get back to something different, or do you feel like it influenced what came next? Uh, I don't know. It was it was fun, <laughs> and it was the idea that we didn't have to make a finished piece of work was really good too. Like we would, nothing was sort of set permanently; it was constantly changing around. Like if you went in one hour to the next, it would be totally different. So something about that was actually, it was quite freeing. Um, and we probably would enjoy doing it again, but it, it, it maybe has influenced me, but maybe not in ways that I could identify particularly, but it's always good to yeah, try, try something new out. <laughs> um, one, one last question, I think we'll, we'll maybe take some questions if anybody has any um, who's watching us, which seems odd because we're just, we, we're, we're quite isolated. It doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't feel like anybody's watching us. Um, <laughs> There are actually about 100 people. Um, yeah, the last thing that I wanted to ask about is because you've done lots of, of different things and, you know, you've taken a break from painting um, and worked with moving image and done, you know, used photographs and obviously explored things like Foley. Um, do you feel like um, that's made you a less, I don't know, uh, marketable artist? You know, do you feel like um, you exist a little bit more on the margins than you might have done if you had just kept doing something more streamlined that's more readily identifiable rather than your practice kind of moving moving around into in, you know and using different media because um, a lot of my favorite artists of dip you know whatever whatever kind of discipline they might be doing have existed on the margins um, and it can be quite a quite a good place to exist you know you can get you can get on with what you want to do um but obviously you may not have that kind of wider reach um in some ways yeah it's, yeah in some ways it, yeah it's tricky to answer actually because <laughs> i was i wasn't intending to not paint but it just kind of i just follow where uh, the idea and like my instinct takes me so it, you can't really fight against that really so i don't really regret anything like okay it's not really a thing of but at the same time, it probably has made me potentially a bit less marketable in some ways, but also it does add a richness to, I think my paintings are richer now for having had that bit of a break and doing other things than there would have been um, had I just kept painting. I think the ideas that I had just didn't fit into painting anymore. So now I've got the, like more of a skill set really. So whatever the idea that I had, I could go to like the appropriate way to try and express the idea or try the idea out. And it just so happens at the like for the last 18 months, two years, they've all been painting based. So it's not as if that wouldn't go back to the other ways of making work, but um, definitely the ideas I've got now, I'm like more focused on painting. Um, but yeah, it does, it does in a way, I mean, there's loads of stuff that I've done. If I had just stuck with painting, there's loads of things that I would have missed out on at the same time. Mm -hmm. So it's, yeah, it's, but ultimately I think my paintings are richer for, um, for having done the other stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, that's... Is it question time? <laughs> let's, see, let's see what Miles thinks. 
Miles, unmute yourself. <laughs> hello, 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 sorry. I'm... <laughs> you're, you're lost, you're lost in the, appear. the dream world uh, of Alicia's uh, paintings. <laughs> it's been hypnotised. <laughs> These dulcet tones. Um, I'm about to appear in a second. Hang on a second. Right, hello, can you see me? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Here we go. Right. There aren't, there, there's, we don't have a huge amount of time. So I'm going to ask a couple of questions here. There's quite a few rolling in all of a sudden, as usual. <laughs> um, so Lizzie asks, I was wondering what future projects you have planned, Rachel? Hmm. Um, it's, it's hard to say, that? really. <laughs> there was a few <laughs> things planned, but a global pandemic's kind of <laughs> put a few things, bricks on a few things. But then nothing. Uh, specifically really um, at the moment like I say I'm focusing on painting and um, that's it that's my main focus um, yeah I'm, I'm showing some work in the Beep painting prize um, in October um, but yeah apart from that a lot of things that were planned have kind of been paused unfortunately so but yeah just keep it on painting basically <laughs> I wonder, Paul, if we could ask you the same question, actually. Well, um, I'm due... You've been busy, Paul. <laughs> I've been reasonably busy. I've, I've made a record, um, which is just about finished. We've been mixing it over the last couple of weeks, and it's it's taken shape. Um, but we've been doing it remotely with a guy in Atlanta whose production work we liked. And we were due to fly out to Atlanta around the time of the lockdown. And... So we've tried to tried to make our record um, by sending everything that we've done in our bedrooms, um, except for Tom, our drummer, who's done stuff in an actual studio behind a pane of glass while somebody else recorded him um, in a socially distant way. Um, but yeah, it's been kind of it's been a big challenge because it's you know we're, we're usually in the same place and we can work quickly and we can go through songs and amend what we're doing. We can improvise and play around with things, but it's been a, a bit more of a um, detached process. However, um, Ben Allen, who we've been working with, is, you know, is great with sounds and um, he can play keys and bass as well, um, which is helpful for us because our keyboard player emigrated, Lucas, uh, and our bass player, Paul, is in, in Liverpool and has his own, his own band going on. So it's been, yeah, it's been a, a, a kind of, interesting interesting bit of time so we'll, the rest of this year i'll be um getting the artwork ready for that um no surprises um <laughs> yeah um, but we, we discussed that earlier on but there's we've got a, a few ideas and maybe about maybe using a painting um on the on the front cover which we've never done before exclusive but yeah we'll see we'll see which artists we can we can we can find yeah. Um, but yeah, we, the rest of the year will just be planning for next year, but everything's so up in the air, you know, yeah. I was doing festivals um, and yeah, I mean, there's still some in the diary, but I, I suspect they'll also be cancelled towards the end of the year and we'll just try and start again next year. And in the meantime, I've, I've bought a drum machine. I'm going to try and learn how to use that. <laughs> <laughs> one, one thing um, a few people have been asking while you've been, talking is that it's quite clear that you two have known each other for quite some time um and um i remember meeting well in fact i met you both separately but i remember i think 2002 seeing um this kind of uh, crazy band playing in the corner of a basement of waygood gallery in newcastle uh, <laughs> Sounds about right. <laughs> and uh, some some particularly um mad hy hyperactive um jumping around from Mr. Smith here. So I just, I was kind of interested in those kind of early days of um, art school and, and knowing each other in, in Newcastle and how, you know, how, in, in that kind of thing, really. Well, we, we were, um, we were kind of, we were both, you know, Hartlepool and Billingham, well, I'm from Billingham and Rachel's from Hartlepool. Um, you know, they're not hives of, cultural activity you know yeah, especially then as well back and we're talking 1997 <laughs> not many people had mobile phones and like 
in, no, you know, there wasn't as much like there wasn't social media and people weren't as quite connected. So you felt even more isolated. It was like a tiny town where you felt like extra isolated, I think, back then. So I think once you got the chance to go to like, art college and then you met people who also liked the same weird music you did and had heard of like some obscure painter or something, there was like, that um, sort of kindred spirit feel, I think, um, which is good. I've got like really fond memories of the foundation course, actually. <laughs> It, well, it kind of, it kind of, for us, we both went to Newcastle and so did Laurie, his sister, who we were in, in, in the band with, um, and other friends of ours and other people who we were at art college with came along as well. And it was kind of quite a little crew from Hartlepool ended up, at, well, mostly at Northumbria doing, doing fine art or doing some of the, doing more, uh, you know, hands-on stuff, whereas I, I decided to do something more academic um and which is why I, I ended up in the studios more often because it was more of a um communal sort of collaborative atmosphere whereas again i was on my own in a library and you know i would be easily just pop in and see what what was happening with your paintings and with laura's and uh our friend Gemma Gemma millward and it, yeah it's it felt like a you know we were growing up we were having we were having fun but also kind of learning about ourselves and what we were into and you know our our tastes would diverge along the way but then we would kind of introduce each other to something else and and I guess that's that's where I'm still at in terms of being in a band you know I, I like making music by myself and um following my own path but I also like that that the, the joy of of collaborating or, or to even share influences or mm -hmm. I mean at the moment I'm doing a radio show for the Star and Shadow DIY cinema on a Saturday and I spend you know it's just a volunteer thing but I spend ages just trying to find the right songs and I'm really eager to share things with people and it's you know to me that's it's very exciting that idea of, of you know somebody listening to something and being into it and feeling that same way that you do or or something similar and being excited by things and I mean that's you know being in a band together was 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 all about that as well just you know let's create our own um, excitement let's try and find find some sort of common ground and that was that was exciting to, to do that. Um, Neil asks does time play part in how you consider your work Rachel I'm thinking how painting itself is a process of time being displayed on a surface as a record of the time taken and you using single frames from film which are really moments of time we don't ever fully experience question mark mm. <laughs> yeah it is, is a big factor actually um, and again that's probably why I was drawn to making moving images because of, there's a different relationship to time so like you've got more time <laughs> and it's like how would I fill that time up what would I do with it um but I like the idea that you there's like a stream of images and then you take an image from that stream and so you've got you pause it and then as you paint in it it's like the image becomes animated again as you paint in it and then once you stop painting it it freezes again so there's like that play between things freezing and then um, being still and then being active um and like just taking, yeah, again, just taking something from a, a slice of time's always been really interesting to me. Um, there's another question from Claire. Have you ever made your own film and then painted stills from that film? How do you decide which still image or object to paint? Um, I have tried that, but it didn't really work out. I don't know why. I did, I did, I think because my, the moving image stuff that I make tends to be a lot more abstract. Whereas the paintings that I make, I tend to, they're like sort of on the edge of abstraction. I don't like it when they go totally abstract. So the, yeah, I have tried that before, but it didn't really work out, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> um, and then in terms of choosing what to paint, it's just like a good instinct really, which is like, it sounds like a bit of a cop-out answer, but it is just something where I'm like, oh, it might be a particular color or a particular texture where I'm like, oh, I really want to paint that. Like the one of the gold head that popped up a couple of times. With that one, it was the red, like the red in that. I just really wanted to paint like that, um, like vermilion y kind of scarlet -y red. So it's usually just a very particular thing that I think would operate well in a painting. Um, but yeah, good instincts, really. That's, yeah, that's, <laughs> that's the honest answer. <laughs> well, one thing I'd quite like to ask both of you, but maybe, maybe more Paul in a way, um, is 
the there's a decision that you make or may, maybe less so if you're if you're from the northeast but there's a decision i think that to stay here if you've kind of you know had your formative you know studies here um you know it, it it's always true that london has this magnetic kind of pull um and at a certain point in uh your your sort of new future that's the success that's growing in front of you often people move to london um, or new york or wherever but you know staying in a in a small city like newcastle is a very particular decision and i'm just kind of interested in that yeah it's um i mean i've been asked about this over the years and and, and even um bumping into people in the street who recognize me or like the band um they'll say, hey, what are you doing up here again? Uh, have you come back to visit? And I'm, I'm just, I've never left. <laughs> never left. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I spoke to, um, I, a, I, was, I did a TV show with Brian Ferry. Um, it was the culture show on the BBC. And um, we both performed, um, me with Maximo Park, doing a kind of stripped down thing and him doing a stripped down thing. Um, and got chatting um, and he was, he was, saying, oh, you're still in, in Newcastle, um, when, you know, wasn't really an option when we were younger because it was really hard to, uh, to, to make it or to, to get that kind of attention that, you know, Roxy Music wanted. Um, and I, yeah, I've never felt, I've never felt that. I mean, I think I've felt sometimes a little bit alienated from um, the music industry and in many ways, I don't really mind that because the music industry is a little bit, you know, it's a business and it's, you know, my, my interest doesn't lie in business. It, it, in, my interest lies in making things. And I feel like I can do that better here. Um, mm -hmm. I can do that better here because I can afford to live here. Yeah, yeah, same for me. Yeah, because like a studio, the size of the studio I've got, I just wouldn't be able to afford that in London. And obviously the space that you've got to work with, like really affects what you can make. Um, and then just having like sort of a standard of life that's comfortable and like manageable as well, whereas yeah. you'd be struggling a bit. Like, you see, I think of being in a uh, band and touring is like, maybe the same for you, Paul. Like, when you're in a band and you get to tour, you feel like you get to see stuff anyway. So you feel like yeah. you get in that, that's ticking that box without you having to actually go and move somewhere else. You kind of get in that outside influence and stuff, but then you get to come home and be, be comfortable. <laughs> yeah, no, it's true. I mean, you know, I feel very lucky to be able to move around. And again, it's not for that kind of thing is not for everyone. So somebody yeah. else find that nomadic lifestyle that um, it's frustrating or, or whatever. Um, I think when I've, when I've been to places like New York or Berlin or Tokyo, um, which is a bit different because again, that, you know, there's less people who speak English. It's, um, you know, the culture is, is different, but um you know, in somewhere like New York or um, or Berlin, you could, if you could afford it, in terms of New York, you could you could live there. And there's a vibe. You know, we talk about that kind of the the draw of places like London. London to me just doesn't have the kind of space that I feel like I, I would I enjoy. You know, I like being up near the coast here, um, being very. It's like you know, 20 minutes or whatever on the on the metro get to the coast you know I feel like it's already a beautiful place but it's also a city uh, up here in Newcastle and I can go back home to Teesside um, where my family are and um, so for me it's kind of it's it's perfect in many ways obviously there are points when you go to somewhere like Berlin um, and you feel like it's vibrant there's a lot of space there and I definitely you know friends of mine and friends of ours um, have moved there and mm -hmm. they have studios there and they're part of, of something small scale and vibrant and there's obviously the bigger scale things that you can tap into in somewhere like that and I think yeah that's that's kind of tempting but then you look at it and say well I'm here and I'm you know I'm kind of representing in a little in a, in a way um, what can be done by staying in the same place if 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 I can make work, um, if I can make records that people can listen to anywhere, and I can go and tour, then why would I why would I want to leave the place that allows me the time and space to to formulate something that's my own, or in terms of the band, our own, you know, the the kind of identity. And I think if we'd have moved to London in in terms of trying to 
get noticed we would have we would have blended in with the crowd perhaps hopefully not you know again being up here allowed us to forge our own identity and be and be a bit odd you know our music is still um it's pop music ultimately but there's something not right about it compared <laughs> to, um, you know mainstream pop music and and oh, well, we've all got in common here yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It's a, that's what we're searching for really, you know, in terms of band. <laughs> and also there's a kind of community here as well with people like um, my friend and collaborator, Peter Brewis and the band Field Music and his brother, David. You know, I've just made a record with um, Rachel Unthank from a folk band, The Unthanks. And I'm a, a big fan of folk music. And I've often wondered, you know, how to put that into my own music um, and, collaborating with her has been really fruitful but I wouldn't have been able to record the album if it wasn't for David Brewis you know having his studio and saying yeah come in and you know if you release it give me some money otherwise you know you can be the guinea pig for our new studio um, <laughs> or is it, if you went to London that would cost you just wouldn't be able to afford to do, to do it, it. No, no. <laughs> yeah. because it's you know I know that not not that many people are going to be interested in it because it's a little bit more niche um you know, I, I want the world to hear it, but I know that that's not possible. So you've got to find a way of making it like any artist, you know, you've got to find a way of, of making the, the work that you want to make. Well, on, on that note, I think we've probably run out of time. And um, I should just say that uh, the next talk will be in two weeks time. And uh, it will be Nina Chua. Um, an artist based in Manchester in conversation. So do join us again for that. Um, thank you very much, Rachel Lancaster and Paul Smith for joining us tonight. It's been really lovely to hear you um, talking about Rachel's work and also a bit about your work, Paul. So Thanks. thank you for that. Um, for people who have joined us on Facebook Live, which has been a bit of an experiment for me, um, I crossed the, crossed the stream slightly. So just- uh, <laughs> You're not supposed to do that, Miles. <laughs> Just to, just to let the people on the Workplace Facebook page, this is a, a Workplace Foundation production and um, <laughs> Workplace Foundation is a charity that Workplace set up in, in 2017 to support emerging artists based across the north of England. So uh, do check out our website and, um, you know, follow what we're doing because there's a really interesting, you know, emergent scene right across the north that is vibrant and vital and important. So... Uh, keep a keep a close eye and uh just to say thank you thank you for joining us um see you next time and i'm it's going to be very abrupt it's always very horrible and abrupt when you end these things so um but we'll put the video on wherever it goes soon and you know we can recreate this lovely atmosphere thank you everyone and goodbye <laughs> thanks <laughs> press leave press leave leave <laughs>